week. I want to bring it a bit closer to home. Um, now, I know that Cancer Research UK is often referred to as the Tesco of the third sector, and I know it's not a compliment, so we don't take it as one. Um, but there are a few lessons for us to learn, I think, and not just the Cancer Research UK. Um, now, just to, to give you some numbers about the challenges that, in my role that I face, this year we'll raise £500 million, and by 2019 20, I've been tasked with turning that into £750 million in a single year, okay, just from the UK. So um, that's quite a leap. And since I've been at the charity, so in the last 12 years, that's gone from £200 million. So 200 to 500 to 750. That's the level of our ambition. Um, you no more want us to steal that from anybody else as, as we want to steal it. So we have to think about how we can grow it. And my reference here to Audi and Tesco um, is quite deliberate because... You know, just like the Pillion Trust is to shelter, there are many, many challenger brands that are nibbling at our ankles. We do great work, they do great work. It's not about who does the better work, but they are nibbling away at our, um, our market share. And who would have thought, you know, very recently that someone like Audi or Lidl could, you know, have such an impact on a retailer like Tesco. So there's no room for complacency, there's no room for arrogance. We can't assume, just because we think it's the best cause in the world, that people are just gonna to continue to support us. So we have to come up with uh, strategies and propositions like everybody else does. But, um, really, I think what this whole day is about, I'm absolutely determined that we do it from a cultural uh, place, that we absolutely understand who we are and why we're doing it first. So, I believe this. If you have the, the, the best people and the, the best strategies and the best investment and infrastructure, it doesn't mean a jot unless you've got your culture right. And for me, culture starts right at the very beginning where you were founded as an organisation. So we're quite um, an established organisation, founded in 1902. And these were our uh, founding fathers. They were scientists who, uh, in Lincoln's Infield, not that far from here, um, uh, founded, it uh, wasn't called Cancer Research UK at the time, but founded our charity, and they put a public appeal, I think the first of its type, asking for £100,000 to cure cancer. Um, the point I'm making here is that's well over 100 years ago. They were pioneers, they were inventors, they asked questions that they didn't have answers to, they knew that it would take years and years and years before uh, they would complete their mission. Um, they also knew that to, uh, to get to proof of concept, you needed to have a lot of evidence um, uh, to do that. So that's who they were then, and it's exactly who we are now. Nothing has changed in any of those ways. And it might explain why... I'm not ready for that. It might explain why we're not seen as a very cuddly, um, fluffy charity. We're not a particularly supportive charity. We're seen as an academic charity. We're seen as a charity that's a little bit remote, that you can't really um, relate to terribly well, unless you know, you're really interested in science. But the point I'm making is our culture started there, and we should not deny it, we should embrace it, and we should um, exploit it. Uh, these are two examples, I think, of charities who do that so well. Um, so we've got here uh, Movember, who I think absolutely is a very irreverent brand. Uh, that's, that's difficult to um, argue with. But if you, I don't know if any of you know, uh, have, have met uh, the guys from uh, Movember, the founders, they are absolutely as their brand appears. And if you talk to them about how they work and if you share stories with them about their organisation versus your own, you will not find a more different organisation, I'm sure of it. And they're just not interested in the rules and the practices and the processes that most organisations um, adopt, and I think that's great. And then you have Amnesty International. And, you know, this is my word. I, I think they're an indignant organisation. I think they have a sense of righteous indignation, which is absolutely right, and they have a... a a purpose which is quite angry. And the point I want to draw out here is not that long ago that the UK staff went on strike. And they went on strike against the leadership at Amnesty International because they didn't like what they were proposing they were doing, moving uh, capacity and capability out of the UK. So the staff literally took to the streets with placards. And I loved that about Amnesty International. That that's, that's, the, that's what's in their DNA. And that's the point I'm making about culture and how important it is. So, at Cancer Research UK, to come back to us, it starts with the brand. The brand and culture are intertwined. Depending on how you're talking about, you, you, you often find you're just switching the language because they're one and the same thing. Uh, we talk about our brand as external brand and internal brand. 
because we are trying to make this point that, you know, culturally there, there, there's nothing to choose between them. On the left is how we looked, and I, I, brand isn't about how you look, but it, I think it uh, illustrates the point I'm trying to make here. But in 2012, before we rebranded, they were the only three manifestations of our logo. You could have it out of white, you could have it out of blue, you could have it out of black. You know, th this looked like an organisation whose brand was put together by academics uh, that were a little bit tight, were a little bit restrictive, um, who really weren't concerned about how other people related to them. In 2014, when we rebranded, oh, sorry, we rebranded in 2012. In 2014, as you see us now, we still talk about research being the answer. Research kills cancer. You still will see in the manifestation through those Cs, the one on the right, which is a little less clear, they're all um, items that you'll get in a lab. The one on the left is trying to um, promote the fact that there's an urgency and a pace to our work. Um, the C represents the fact that we're breaking cancer down. It also represents the fact that we can only do it together, so we're bringing people in um, to unite with us to, to conquer cancer. So there's more of a story to the right-hand side, but it's much more than that. We were consciously saying that we have to be more accessible and more relevant, and people have to understand us, and because we believe if, if they did, they're more likely to support us. So I talked about external brand and internal brand. This is our internal brand. And the fact that I can sort of put it on, on one slide, I think, says it all. We used to have um, organisational values. We used to have brand values. We used to have leadership behaviours. We scrapped the lot. We now have just three beliefs, and you see them at the top there. Sharp minds and brave hearts win. Our stories change the world. United, we're stronger than cancer. Just three statements that we expect anybody, anybody who's employed by Cancer Research UK to evoke. And because there's just the three of them, it's not difficult to remember them, and it's not difficult to sort of learn them and behave like them. So sharp, sharp minds and brave hearts, we're basically saying we don't want just intellect or academics or geeks, and we don't want people who've just got too high a risk appetite, who are very creative and a little bit unpredictable. We're looking for that sweet spot in the middle where you, we encourage our staff to be intelligent and take risks and be creative and prove the evidence to back, up, to back up their assertion. And we want that from everybody, regardless of the position they're in. Our stories change the world. We've got some amazing stories, and we teach them to our staff. So they believe them, they know them, they're inculcated with them, so that they can go and spread the gospel of how we're beating the, you know, the biggest fear known to man. And United We're Stronger Than Cancer, we don't believe for a moment we can do it on our own. And we're not just talking about our supporters and our donors. We're talking about other research institutes around the world. We're talking about government. We talk about corporates. You know, we have to unite everybody. And these three belief statements underpin everything we do. And it's why I think we can be successful uh, around growth. And just as a quick an anecdote, because we split them into our environments, so how we look and feel when you're in the workplace, our behaviours, how we work, and the employee life cycle, what you can expect as an employee. I'll just take one out of those. You can see at the bottom in the middle, it says Uniting Events. Once a year, we have a fundraising week, and we fundraise for Cancer Research UK. Now, that might sound obvious, but I wonder how many charities in this room absolute, uh, actually fundraise for themselves. We always ask other people, third parties, to fundraise. And we don't just ask the fundraisers to do this. Every single member of staff of our charity for one week a year fundraises for us. And in that week, we expect them to be creative, we expect them to uh, you know, rip up all the rules, we expect them to create um, new stories, and we expect them to show that we're doing it together. We have some crazy, crazy things. You know? So our strategy director dressing up as Dolly Parton, doing a performance of Islands in the Stream. Um, he's the brightest guy I've ever met. He looked like the most stupid guy I'd ever met at the same time. But it's somehow unified, and it typified what we mean by these beliefs. And in the week this year, we did it in October, we raised £60,000 in the office, we raised a million pounds through the shops. You know, it's not because we're fundraisers, it's because culturally we understand the importance and the purpose of our work. Okay, so, when I say the fluffy stuff, um, I don't want to uh, belittle what I mean there, because it's not about behaviour. But the point I want to make here is, you have to apply this thinking to your operating model. Now, this is our current operating model. If you'd gone back a few years, it would have looked very different. So we've put a CRM system in, but we did it years ago. I'm sure most charities here will have a CRM system. That, that enabled this piece of work to happen, but it's just an enabler. So yes, we've got all our donors onto one database. We have a single view of them. We know a bit more about them. We have a bit more insight into them. But that big deal. 
Culturally, what we had to change was the mindset around who owned the supporter, who owned the data, who owned the supporter journey, who owned the relationship between marketing, um, event management, fulfillment, all those sorts of things. Who did the strategy? So where, if you look at this uh, diagram, those purple verticals, they might look like fundraising departments. They're not. They're fundraising streams. They just represent where we get our money from. Where we make our decisions and where we run the business are in the horizontal lines. So the turquoise one, we call them director capabilities. They're across, that's across my director. So we have marketing as a function. We have portfolio management as a function. We have comms as a function. So all those things just happen in one place across the portfolio. If you look at the specialist service, strategy, consumer insight, planning, tech, they're done in a central place across the portfolio. So all our decisions are made on a neutral basis. My guess is we're all digital dinosaurs in this room. We might not be. I don't want to be rude. But, you, you know, you don't have to be sort of a leading edge not to be called a digital dinosaur. But it, what it did is it prompted us to rethinking the way we approach this space. And so what we've moved from is a, a central approach where we have a team that does everything uh, because they're experts to deploying that expertise right across the charity. So we expect people to be digital marketers now. Um, and that's just one example. We have things like scrums now where we bring virtual teams together who work on a business project. And they might come from um, uh, the financial analysis team. They'll come from the IT team. They'll come from the digital team. They might come from the marketing team. And they work in scrums. So it's not about reporting in a, um, in a vertical sense. But they just have to uh, crack uh, a tech problem that the organization is facing. And they do it quickly because tech costs a lot of money. It, costs, it can cost thousands of pounds a day. So they have to do it quickly, intuitively, and it, ha and it has to be in, um, incremental. <laughs> um, so we've introduced scrums as a way of working. We also have a DigiFest. Twice a year, we have a digital festival in the organization where we bring the outside world in, and we just ask people to excite all our staff. And they can tell them what the future looks like, even if we can't relate to it. So again, it's just from a cultural perspective, setting our expectation for how we expect our organisation to be, and not necessarily in the future, but today. And that really is me done. So in summary, I just want to say these things, that if you want to grow, you need to think first whether you're going to steal the market or grow the market, and if it's about stealing the market, for God's sake, you better make it disruptive, because let's face it, I think most charities in the world, we're a little bit bland, so if you, if you want to grow your market, then you need to stand out. I believe the markets are there, and they're consumer-driven markets, and those consumers are the same people as our donors and our supporters, so meet them halfway. From a cultural perspective, be authentic, look within first, look at your DNA, know who you are and what you represent before you put a wrapper on it, because that doesn't fool anybody. And then purposefully design your structures. Work on your operating model knowingly, so you don't trip yourself up. Because we all know, you know, humans just screw it up. So you need to get that design right in the first place. And then finally, really do be prepared to reinvent yourself. Anybody who has not got an innovation agenda, I think in fundraising, really, I'll guarantee you're going to fail in the long term. Thank you very much.